So yeah, this message really goes along with that theme that came out in the psalm this morning of delighting yourself in the Lord. Um, he will give us the desires of our heart. And also the meek will inherit the earth. And with that word too, the light extinguishing the darkness. That all comes out in, in this. My talk today is, a, is about um, the life of one of the early saints. So in 155 AD, a Roman official told a very old man to burn incense in honor of the emperor of Rome. So the Romans considered the emperor a god. And the man's name was Polycarp. But this man shook his head and refused. So I first heard about this saint at a Christian gathering many years ago. And he actually inspired me to to do a painting. Um, is a painting from one of the most poignant scenes from his life. And um, I don't know whether to show it now or, or later. Maybe, okay, you can put it up now. I'll talk about it a bit. Um, this is the scene of him uh, feasting with these two men. And I'll just tell you right now that, that they were soldiers that were coming to take him away. And I'll get more into that story at the end, but I want to dig a little bit into who he was, his life here. But he was a faithful man, and it reminds me of this verse from Romans 2. It says, To those who by perseverance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, and who reject the truth and follow wickedness, there will be anger and wrath. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Greek. For God does not show favoritism. So who, who is this man, Polycarp? Um, it's through, through researching about him, I, I couldn't quite figure out if he was from Turkey or Greece, but he for sure was a Gentile, so he wasn't a Jewish Christian. But he honored the Jewish roots, and um, that was one of the key events that was recorded about his life, how he went up to Rome to see the, the um, I guess he was the Pope at the time, Anicetus. I don't know if he was actually a pope the way we think of the pope today, but um, and they were considering whether uh, they should celebrate the res resurrection of Christ during the, the Jewish Passover season or whether they should do it on the Sunday following the Passover. And that, that whole time thing got changed after a while so that sometimes now, you know, Easter as we know it could be a whole month away from Passover. But Polycarp was from the eastern part of the church and that whole eastern part of the church in Asia Minor they really wanted to continue celebrating Passover um, or the resurrection and, and the death of Jesus in the Passover season and so unfortunately when they got together they had to agree to disagree and Polycarp was a gracious man but you know that was kind of a, a, a beginning the, the kind of the separation of, of the Jewish roots and and as we find out here, Polycarp was a disciple of John. And um, I think even John possibly in one of his Gospels hints at the fact that some of the Gentiles were starting to, to um, lord it over the Jews and, and to kind of take the first place. So um, that, heart, that started happening quite early on in the church. So he was, like I said, the the bishop of the Christian community, and it was in Smyrna, which is, is really interesting. And so it was during the early to second, um, mid-second century, and he's one of the earliest Christians whose writings have survived. So Smyrna is today the city of Izmir on the west coast of Turkey. And interestingly, all the seven churches that were, were from Jesus to the the, the messengers of these churches, uh, they were all in what is today modern Turkey. So none of them were in the western part of the church, which is kind of interesting because the western part of the church was kind of 
divesting or, or diverging from the Jewish roots faster than the early part. I don't know if that means anything. Obviously, he had some major corrections for the, the churches even in the, in the east there. And really, Smyrna was, um, was one of the rare churches where he really commended them outright. So I'm going to actually read from the book of Revelations that, that small um, message to the church of Smyrna. And it is most likely that Polycarp was the bishop uh, of the church of Smyrna to whom Jesus, through John, through Revelation, was sending this message. And of course, this message is universal, and it's for all in church history, but it could have been directly to Polycarp as well. So it says, to the messenger of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last, who was dead and became alive, says, I know how you are suffering, how poor you are, but you are rich. I also know that those who claim to be Jews and slander you, but they are just a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are going to suffer. The devil is going to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. Your suffering will go on for 10 days, but be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let the person who has ears listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Everyone who wins the victory will never be hurt by the second death. So there's a lot of evidence that um, Polycarp did in fact exist and that he was actually an eyewitness to the Apostle John. Um, most historians say he was born in AD 69, right around the time of, of the, the Jewish war of between 66 and 70. And in 70, as we know, the temple was totally destroyed and Jerusalem ran, ransacked and, and many Jews were killed at that time. Um, he could have been born earlier though, and he may have been a young boy or even a teenager at the time when the temple was destroyed. So most of the apostles died as martyrs well before the early non-biblical Christian writings occurred. But John didn't. John was the only apostle not to die as a martyr. And there's evidence he lived until 100 AD, so he grew into old age and, and he... Uh, Remember how he was exiled to the island of Patmos? There he wrote the book of Revelation. But he was released from Patmos, and he did indeed die of old age. And during his lifetime, he became known as the son of love. And throughout his later years, he had many students, of which Polycarp was one. So Asubius, one of the early church fathers, he tells us that Parley, Polycarp was indeed a disciple of John the Apostle. And two others, well regarded in early Christian history and contemporaries, um, they said the same, Irenaeus and Tertullian. They individually confirmed this connection in their respective writings. Also, Jerome, another Christian historian and scholar, confirmed his existence and relationship with John. Irenaeus claimed that Polycarp wrote several letters but only one of them survives to this day. So Polycarp actually wrote a letter, which um, we can read. It's to the Philippians. So Paul also wrote a letter to the Philippians, as we know. Irenaeus, was, uh, he claimed to be a direct disciple of Polycarp. And he writes this. He said, I could describe the very place in which the blessed Polycarp sat and taught, his going out and coming in, the whole tenor of his life, his personal appearance, how he would speak, and the conversations he had held with John and with others who had seen the Lord. How, he, how did he make mention of their words and of whatever he had heard from them respecting the Lord? So that's, that's pretty amazing that um, this man, the Bishop of Smyrna, 
had, he was a direct um, disciple of, of John and heard from the words of, of people that had seen the Lord. So, in, and we have his testimony as, as further witness to the truth of the gospel. So Polycarp, um, he referred to Saint Paul the Apostle as well in his writings, in his letter to the Philippians. He stressed the personal importance of Paul as a primary authority of the Christian church. Now, at that time, Paul was actually, some of his writings were being misused by a group called the Gnostics, who were trying to really deny the physicality of Jesus' uh, life and resurrection. And, um, and through doing that, they invited in sin, and, and, and this was a total heresy that, that people were, who were really following the Lord were ha having to come against. Polycarp, in response, reclaimed Paul as a treasured figure of the Orthodox Church. It is apparently, thus partly due to Polycarp, that Paul, the disputed apostle, became a theologically respectable part of the Church's tradition. So that's one of the quotes um, from uh, uh, one of the histories that I was looking at. And, um, and so uh, Polycarp held up Paul he held up the, uh, the, the teachings of the Christian Bible. And in his letter to the Philippians, he actually quotes from 20 of the 27 books in the New Testament. So he's, it's, it's almost repeating a lot of what's being said there. And that's not a bad thing because at the time there were people trying to bring in heresies and other teachings and you hear about all these things the the different gospels and writings that are supposedly out there but he did not quote from any really disputed source like that he only quoted from the the writings of the new testament so i talked about how he went to see anicetus in rome so i'll go down to here um, and, and how John made reference to that fact. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, read this because maybe some of you haven't considered this passage, but this is from one of the books of John. He, he said, I, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers, and he stops those who want to do so and puts some out of the church. Now, in, in studying the context of that letter and Diotrephes being a clearly Gentile person, some of the, the, the scholars think that that was a Jewish um, persecution in the church, that they were actually starting to like get conceited, like Paul said, don't be conceited towards the, the Jews because they are the ones that have the promises of God and God is still going to use them even if they're fighting against you, even if um, they aren't accepting your message right now, that the Lord is going to bring them back in. And of course, there was many Jews in the early church, but there was that divide that started to begin to happen. And um, that's something that the Lord is trying to heal. And in our day, there's been incredible steps towards that healing. Take, for example, what just happened with the 21 days of prayer and um, millions of Christians praying for the Jewish people throughout the world. So that's an amazing thing. And that's something that has to happen before the end times that God is going to restore uh, that relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles in the body so that the Jewish people will come to know and accept their Messiah in the end. So in the, his letter to uh, Philippians, like I mentioned, uh, it's, it's referencing so many of the books in the New Testament, and there's, and there's a lot of great content in there. Um, he thanked uh, this church for caring for Ignatius when he came through Philippi, and he encouraged them to live for Christ. 
He explains several ethical ways to serve Christ and gives standards for deacons, young men, and young women. In chapter 8, he pointed out that Jesus is the reason for righteous living and an example of righteous living. So our, the one who we pattern our life is on is Jesus. One other thing that really marked his life and, and even in this, this letter is just how he was kind to people who stumbled and fell. So people that made a mistake and fell in the church, there was a, a gentleness and a grace that he had for them. But that gentleness and grace was not there for heretics. He was super vehemently opposed to heretics. He even called one of them Marcion, I believe his name was. He said, yes, I know who you are. You're the son of Satan. <laughs> so he was not, not gentle at all when he thought people were twisting and perverting the gospel. So finally in this letter, he encouraged them to pray for those in authority. And that's generally meaning the Roman authorities at that time because they were under the, the boot of Rome. And the church was experiencing persecution, um, especially there in Smyrna. So he says here, pray also for kings and potentates and princes and for those that persecute and hate you and for the enemies of the cross that your fruit may be manifest to all and that ye may be made perfect in him. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and um, remember he, he commended them for hosting Ignatius on his way to Rome and, and Rome actu uh, Ignatius was actually uh, martyred in Rome and thrown to the wild beasts. So the fact that he's telling them to pray for the Romans is pretty amazing. So I'm just going to get into the context of this painting here. So Polycarp, um, he was, he cared for his flock. He loved his people, he loved the Lord, and at that time the Christians in Smyrna were being threatened with execution if they did not worship the emperor. And so he would actually end up giving his life for the Lord. And it's quite a story, actually. And I'll try to tell it in, in the last little bit of my message here. So it was actually the first detailed account of martyrdom since Luke's account of Stephen 120 years earlier in the book of Acts. And we owe the account of Polycarp's death to the Christians of Smyrna who wrote it up as a letter and circulated it to the churches. Now, this, this account is kind of fantastical, and I would say it may be a little mythologized and embellished, but I think the principles that we learn from, from the account of his martyrdom are true, and they're happening today. And there are martyrs that are experiencing the same kind of things that, that are told in this letter today. Um, I think of Richard Wormbrand, who spent, I think it was 13 years in a Romanian concentration camp and, and um, then just came out and preached the gospel and just an amazing Jewish believer. And then Watchman Nui, who we studied a bit last year, how he was put into prison for 20 years and, and he died in prison. Um, so also, you know, mentioning The Sound of Freedom, someone did, just amazing the courage that there are believers who exhibit by the power of the Holy Spirit through the truth of his word, through knowing what is righteous because of the character of God and what is revealed to our hearts as in, in terms of our, our morality, but also in the word. And it's just incredible what believers are willing to do to sacrifice for the Lord. So <clears throat> this is from the Word Among Us. I'm going to read this. Uh, Polycarp was martyred before the period of the great persecutions organized from Rome by emperors like Diocletian. His story reveals that the tension or the reveals the tensions that were already building up throughout the empire. 
as Christians rejected the gods and goddesses that everyone else was worshiping. The pagans called the Christians atheists for this apparent lack of religious feeling. But as Polycarp made clear to the Roman government official, the real atheists are those who don't worship the one true God. So um, the story goes like this. Basically, he, he was, the, the Christians in Smyrna were being uh, persecuted. They were being forced to worship the emperor. And, and the church there, they told him, you should go into hiding. So they said to Polycarp, hide in, hide in this farmer's house. And um, so he's, he's in this house, and there's somebody, I, I think he was a young person. That's at least how the story goes. This young person in the church rats him out and tells the authorities where he is. So they made an edict to go and, and, and get Polycarp. Um, they wanted him to reject Jesus and to pledge allegiance to the em emperor. And so they send these, these two soldiers, as my, my painting shows, and they came around supper time, and he laid out this feast for them to eat when they came. So he knew somehow that they were coming, and he, he put this feast out for them, and his hospitality was shown, his, his love for even his enemies. And, and so I called that painting um, Polycarp's Hospitality. And so they're trying to, to convince him to, to, you know, just, is it such a hard thing to, to just say, you know, Caesar is Lord, you don't have to meet it, just say it. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. So they ended up having to, to take him. Supposedly, he, they put him on a mule and rode him into the city. And there, a couple uh, higher-up officials came to, to speak with him. And they, they again asked him to, to renounce his faith. And, and you know, just because they, they, they wanted, they, they actually thought he was an admirable person. They didn't want him to, to face what he was going to face. And he said, he said no. And um, there's a couple quotes here. Just let me find them. They're just quite, quite amazing. So, yeah, they tried to change his mind. They said, what harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar, and offering a sacrifice and saving yourself from death? But he said no. So he was taken to the noisy stadium. As he entered, he heard a voice from heaven that came to him, be strong, Polycarp, and act like a man. No one saw the speaker, but our friends who were there heard the voice. So that's how the account goes. So the proconsul told Polycarp, because he was brought before the proconsul, who had the power of life and death over him. He told Polycarp to consider his old age. He said to him, swear by the fortune of Caesar, repent and say, away with the atheists. Now, at that time, the Romans called the Christians the atheists because they didn't believe in the Roman gods, which is kind of funny. Um, today, of course, Atheists are people that don't believe in God at all. But they said, away with the atheists. Instead, Polycarp turned to the crowds and said, he said to them, away with the atheists. Now angry, the Roman official again told Polycarp, deny your loyalty to Jesus and burn the incense or be burned at the stake. Stoically, Polycarp refused and said, 86, 80 and six years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. So the Roman official looked sternly at Polycarp and curtly uttered, burn him. Polycarp in turn bravely said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour so that in the company of the martyrs I may share in the cup of Christ. So Polycarp was led to a pile of wood with a tall wooden stake at the center. He was strapped onto the stake with leather. Normally they actually nailed the people to the stakes, but he said, um, that he would stand there, they didn't need to nail him. <laughs> so they let him do that. Then the guards lit the dry wood. As the fire grew and began to grow around Polycarp, he said nothing. However, it soon became apparent that not enough wood was placed to consume Polycarp. The flames didn't burn him. Finally, a guard stepped near Polycarp and pierced his side, after which Polycarp died. So that's his story. 
And to end, I just want to read 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 10, because I really believe that it, it gives that, it gives that story, his story is, is a living example of what is being said here. So it says, now we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassingly great power is not from God, I mean is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on all sides, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always consigned to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And in keeping with what is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. We who have the same spirit of faith also believe and therefore speak, knowing that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is extending to more and more people may overflow in thanksgiving to the glory of God. Therefore, therefore, saints, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory that is far beyond comprehension. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal.